already been away from Genesis for a while, and even though I've probably covered this particular sex, matter of fact, I'm sure I have in chapter 27 online, I want to pick up here for our weekly study because the remainder of this book is going to deal with Jacob and his family. That's the biggest thing that we have to look at here. You know, we're going to deal with, with Jacob and all the things that uh, happened to him and the sons and of course, we'll end up with dealing with Joseph and a lot of, but this is important. Now we're dealing with, of course, who will become Israel. And this is where it kind of branches off here. So that's why I want to pick up in chapter 27 and just kind of focus on Jacob. And well, he's like everybody else. He has his shortcomings. And that's the one thing I, I tell people time and time again you see the proof of Scripture in the way that it depicts mankind. If this, were, this book were written by just men, men would be heroes all the time. You would never see a shortcoming. You would never see a sin. You would never see anything bad about them. But God shows us who they are and what they are. He doesn't hide anything from us. So we're going to look here at a deception. It's the deception of Jacob for the blessing. You know, God expects his servants to carry out their spiritual responsibilities by faith. There's that very, it's an important word. We need to look at it again, faith. If there's a word, excuse me, that is carried over from Genesis to Revelation, it's faith. Faith in God, faith in what he says, what he's going to do. Unfortunately, Faith is not always present. And when it's not there, it complicates matters. When our faith gets weak, when our knees buckle, we get into trouble. And this chapter, chapter 27, portrays a, an entire family attempting to carry out their responsibilities by their physical senses, with their physical ability without faith. They're trying to do things on their own, and it's just not going to work. And this is a familiar story. I remember way back in Sunday school as a little fella hearing this story about the deception there. And, but uh, it's a story of a, of a family that's has, it's fragmented. It's a family that knows what God wants and yet they're trying to do things on their own. And I want to tell you something. Every participant in this is guilty. They're all at fault. Not just Jacob. Everybody's trying to deceive everybody else. Everybody's trying to gain something here. You know, Isaac knew God's oracle to Rebekah back in <coughs> chapter 23 that the elder would serve uh, the younger, yet the younger would serve the elder, the younger would be the blessing, that, but yet. She has set out to try to do something. She's trying to manipulate what's going on. That's just tea. Don't get excited. <laughs> you know, Esau agrees to the plan. You know, he broke his oath that he made to Jacob back in chapter 25. And he sold his birthright, what? For some stew. A little red pottage. But now he, he wants it back. He wants that. He wants his blessing. You know, Rebecca and Jacob, with just cause, each tried to achieve God's blessing by deception without faith or love. I'm going to tell you something right now, even before we begin the study here. God's plan is going to work out. Jacob is going to be in the line of the Messiah. He's going to receive the promise. He's going to receive the blessing. All they needed to do was trust. And there's something you're going to miss in this chapter. The one thing that not one of these four people did was pray. Not one time is it listed here that they asked the Lord, what do you want, what do you want me to do? How, how do you want me to go about this? Not one time. So the conflict, now it's, it's going to be a, a longer conflict than ever anticipated. You know, Jacob and Esau were greatly deepened, you know, by the, by the problems here. And 
it's going to be a, a, a family feud here. It's going to split a family. And the story is not just about Jacob. He alone did not destroy the family. Let me tell you, Jacob did not destroy the family. What destroyed this family? Parental preferences. Parental favoritism. That's what destroyed this family. Now I'm going to read, start reading now in verse 1 and following here. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old, his eyes were dim so that he could not see. He called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old, and I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go into the field, and take me some venison, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. I do this, uh, you know, if you heard it online, I do this kind of as a play because it, you could really put a play here. You see different scenes and the first scene is Isaac and Esau that we just read about. You know, Isaac is offering to bless Esau now. His, that's his favorite son. Here's the favorite son. Rebecca's favorite son is Jacob. We have a split here and the sons are as different as day and night. You know, there's some important information that we're given in these few verses. First, that Isaac's eyesight was very poor because of his old age. This is important. Moreover, stress is placed on the love that he had for wild game and tasty food. It's something that, oh, Isaac liked. He liked this is his favorite food, or he thinks it's his favorite food. And if you look here, you notice that it's Isaac's palate that governs his heart. Used to be old saying, wait till a man's heart to his stomach, but here it is. I want that taste. You go out and get that venison out like fix it up for me, and I want to bless you afterward. But Isaac's point was that he intended, even though he knew differently, he knew what God had said, he was going to bless Esau. Here uh, was a dilemma for Rebecca. Rebecca's close by somewhere. She heard all this and she's prompted to action. One thing I've noticed in scripture, the wife is not far away. She's always close by, she's always listening. Remember when the three visitors came to Abraham, Sarah was close enough to hear because she laughed. Here, Rebecca's close by, she's listening. You know, maybe she already suspected that something was going to happen. She knew the favored son there. Verse 5 says, And Rebecca heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son. She's close by. She's listening. Maybe she knew right away when he called Esau to come. He knew. She knew he's up to no good. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebecca spake unto Jacob her son saying, Behold, I heard you, thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats. And I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father peradventure will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a, I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, 
and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave him the savory meat and bread which she had prepared under the hand of her son Jacob. Well, if we're sitting in the audience watching a play, act one is over. Esau has left the scene and now we shift to a different scene outside the tent and we see what's going on here. Second act. Act two, it's Rebecca and Jacob. Rebecca sent Jacob in the tent attempt to stop Isaac's plan. Note now that no time, at no time does the scripture ever mention one of them saying, Lord, what do we do? How do we approach this? They not they don't ask for guidance, they don't ask for direction. They don't say, Lord, is this your will? Nothing. These are four people trying to get what they want without the Lord. They simply act on their own accord. Rebecca is absolutely sure, you see that, that she can duplicate the taste of Isaac's favorite meat with goat meat. Now, you go out and get that venison, make that savory meat that I like, and Rebecca said, I can do the same thing with a goat. Here again, he's going to be fooled by what he eats, thinking it's venison. But Jacob has a different approach. He's, he's not sure he can fool his father. These are two different men. You might say that Jacob is kind of a bookworm type person, let's say. He's smooth skinned. He doesn't smell like the field. His brother does. His brother stays out there all the time. He's, he's hairy and he's got that smell to him. And the voices are maybe similar, but there's a difference there. Of course, a lot of times brothers sound alike. Over the years, I've gotten a lot of information about my brother when I answered the phone and they thought they were talking to him because we sound like, sound like daddy. But still, there's a father or a mother can tell the difference. But see, notice one thing about Jacob here. He doesn't have any guilt. He doesn't know guilt's involved. He only has fear. He is afraid that he's going to be found out in deception. He doesn't say, oh, mom, I, I don't feel right about this. He just feels like he may get caught. He's just, just like a kid. I don't feel guilty about getting in the cabinet and stealing that piece of candy. I'm just afraid I'll get caught. No guilt, just fear. But the blessing's in danger now. and Everything must be risked. At least that's Rebecca's take on it. Including the possibility of a curse. Well, Mom, if, if, if he finds out, he's going to curse me. Oh, bet the curse be on me. If he curses you, it'll be on me. Hmm. So Jacob does as his mother told him. Rebecca even had him put on some of Esau's clothes and she wrapped him with the skins of the kid goats. He's got that savory meat with him and he's ready. Verse 18. And he came into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob, and Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. Right there we have what? It's a lie. The deception begins. I have done according to thou, as thou biddest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that my soul may bless me. Wait a minute, we have two more lies here. I have done what you have told me. No, I did. And this is not venison. Again, no guilt, but we see a lot of deception going on here. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that house has found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto his father and felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, 
and he brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near me now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God, give thee the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed is everyone that curseth thee and blessed is he that blesseth thee. Act three. Here we go. Sheen's, the scene shifts back to Jacob's tent. Jacob, I mean not to, uh, Isaac's tent. And Jacob comes in. Jacob is deceiving his father to obtain the blessing. He, if you, I didn't stop to count. How many lies did he tell? So well, he's just misleading, misleading, or not talking about misleading here. That's a lie. And he's lied time and time. He's been prodded by his mother. He lied twice to his father, first about his identity. I mean, he saw that firstborn. Second, he said that God gave him success in hunting. I know the other little lies in between there. You know, he's prodded by his mother, but you know what? He could have stood up and said, no, this isn't right. I'm going to trust the Lord. But it doesn't happen. You know, three times we see the old man was suspicious. Three times. You see that? In verse 20, he says, uh, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? He, he's, how did you do this? He says, he wants to, Your voice is wrong. You know, he, he comes over, let me feel you. He wants to smell you. He's not convinced. So he's, he keeps looking. And finally, he gives up and says, okay, this must be him. But did you notice that Isaac is deceived by his senses? He's deceived by the touch. He cannot tell the, the skins of those kids from the hair, hairy arms of his son. The smell... He smelled the garments and he smelled his, his sense of smell. And so he blesses Jacob thinking he was Esau. His first inclination was this is not the voice. But he doesn't question him any further about that. And so he blesses him. The blessing included prosperity in crops, dominion over nations, dominion over his brother, cursing on those who cursed him and Blessing on those who blessed him. Boy, we've heard that one before. He's just bringing that promise to Abraham right down to this boy now. Let people serve thee, nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. Let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed is everyone that curseth thee. Blessed is he that blesseth thee. It's worked. It's worked. He's, he's deceived his father. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of the blessing, of blessing Jacob, Jacob was yet scarce gone out of the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came from his hunting. You know, right here, you see God's hand. You see God, God's working here, whether anybody sees it or not. If Esau would have come just a few minutes earlier, there would have been a tremendous rumble going on there. And God would have had to intervene because Esau was the more masculine of the two. He was the one who was the fight. He was an outdoorsman. And he also, when he came back, said he also made savory meat and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat his son's venison that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that taketh, take, hath taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten 
of all before thou comest, and I have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. Now when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtility, and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine I have sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou one blessing, my father? Bless me even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be in the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shall thou live and shall serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou have, shall have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. The scene changes again. We're still in the tent. Now it's Esau coming in to his father. He comes in and it's uh, interesting. He's bringing that savory meat that his father likes. He brings it to him and it's, what are you doing? I just had dinner. He's confused. He doesn't know. Esau had come home and now he's pleading with his father for a blessing and now he's brought that food and emotions are running high. Isaac trembled violently over what had happened and Esau was very bitter and he is angry. Isaac knew that he had been trampling on God's plan. He knew this and he had been overruled and there's no going back now. I think the first thing that comes to Isaac's mind right now is that I was trying to push God's plan away and do it my way. I was trying to, and he found out. I think that's the trembling. How close he came to defying God and what could be the consequences for that. Esau began to, at this point, realize the true nature of Jacob. Twice he had overreached or deceived Esau by taking his birthright back in chapter 25 and now he feels like he's taking the blessing. Well, he sold his birthright and the blessing was never his to begin with. But he's angry. Now all that was left for Esau was to, Father, is there any blessing left for me? And it's the blessing of a profane person. Esau would not enjoy the earth's riches or heaven's due. The Edomites, who were Esau's descendants, would live in a land less fertile than Israel, the Holy Land. Also, Esau would live by force. He'd be subservient to Jacob and be restless, just like Ishmael. Same type of idea here. So in a sense, Rebekah and Jacob won. Though they gained nothing, absolutely nothing, that God was not going to give anyway. But they lost a great deal. They won, they thought, but they lost. I mean, they lost a lot. God would have worked out everything without conniving, without going through deception. Their activities only succeeded in doing what God's prophecy had predicted to begin with. God's program will triumph. And oftentimes it triumphs in spite of human activities, human trying to intervene, getting ahead of God. You know, this is a story of parental favoritism. And it tore that family completely apart. The story is also 
an account of spiritual insensitivity. They're not listening to God. All the natural senses play a very important part, especially the, the sense of taste in which Isaac prided himself, but it gave him the wrong answer. Got a spider up here chasing me around. Uh, reliance on one's senses for spiritual discernment not only is fallible, it's, it's gone over there somewhere, but often it fouls up life unduly. Most importantly, this story is about deception from beginning to end. Jacob's only hesitancy was the fear of being caught, of being cursed instead of blessed. At least he realized such actions would place God's promise in jeopardy. Jacob would later learn that blessings are given by God and they're not gained by deceit. And it's going to be a lesson that's very, very difficult for him to learn. It's going to take him a number of years as we move forward to learn a lesson. You know, there's no saying no good deed goes unpunished. Well, this is true. He, what Rebecca meant as a good deed, it's going to be punished. You know, Rebecca's favorite son is going to leave. He's going to have to flee. She's never going to see him again. The family is going to be separated by miles. And Jacob is going to be deceived himself. I'm going to stop there.